Good evening, everyone. All has gone to plan. You'll be watching this service on Christmas Eve. So welcome to our worship for Christmas Eve. You may have waited to watch this until late at night. The clock may be about to tick over to midnight and on to the next day, Christmas Day. Maybe you're watching earlier in the evening. Either way, I think this is a, a special moment, this moment of gathering to worship in the evening on Christmas Eve. Christmas Day by now is fast approaching, but I hope now is the opportunity to spend some time in calm, quietly remembering what we are about to do. And I think moments of calm are important. Maybe you've had a very busy day. Maybe you've been welcoming guests. Maybe you've been travelling to be a guest in someone else's house. Maybe you've been wrapping presents and preparing food and generally getting everything ready. Or maybe you've had a quiet day. But now, the evening before Christmas Day, everything is done. And if it isn't done by now, it's too late. If you've forgotten to buy a present for someone or you realise you've forgotten an important part of your festive meal, it's too late to worry about it now. And I think that's quite a liberating moment. We know the run-up to Christmas can be a stressful time and the day itself can also be difficult and that's because people and families can be complicated and Christmas can bring up all sorts of deep emotions. As I'm recording this, it's been on the news today that the rules that have been set about who can meet who at Christmas time may in fact be changing. So the run up to this particular Christmas may have been particularly stressful for some of you. But I hope that we can put that aside just for a little while tonight and we can focus simply on worshipping God. We can forget all of that work of preparation we've been doing. We can even forget all the things we will be doing tomorrow. Now is indeed the time to come before God. Now I know that for many of you, you will be having a Christmas that is very different to Christmases you've had before. Maybe you're going to be by yourself and meeting family online rather than in person, which is what I'm going to be doing. Maybe all of the traditions and rituals you've built up for yourself over the years are going to be disrupted aren't going to be possible. And I also know that some of you will have an empty place at your table this year because in the last 12 months you've lost somebody who you loved and shared your life with. But tonight we can bring all of that before God. We will later be lighting our fifth and final candle which represents Jesus and Christmas Day. But now we begin with some words from the book of Isaiah. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. And so we come before God in prayer. Lord, we have walked in darkness this year. We have known the valley of the shadow of death. We have borne the yoke of many burdens. We have also seen oppression and discrimination at work in our world. 
and we have seen people struggling against it, striving for justice and freedom at great risk and cost. We have seen our lives changed and disrupted, and we have lived with constant fear and worry. And now this Christmas Eve, in the quiet of the evening, in the darkness of a December night, in a moment of calm, we long for your light to come. We are hungry for joy and celebration. We are ready to again welcome the Christ child into the world, to receive his compassion and grace and to embrace his peace. We are ready to commit ourselves to be builders of his coming kingdom. So Lord, be with us tonight as we ponder the eternal mystery of a God who came into our world to live with us and be alongside us, fully human and yet still divine. A God who was born on the earth to bridge the gap between heaven and earth. Lord, be with us as we worship. Amen. Silent night, oh. As is the tradition, we have been lighting candles each week, each Sunday during Advent to mark the passing of those weeks. In the first Sunday of Advent, we lit a candle for hope. We lit a candle for hope and we looked 
ahead to an uncertain future. On the second Sunday of Advent, we lit a candle for peace and we prayed for those countries in the world where there is war. We prayed too for families who may have been split apart by conflict. On the third Sunday, we lit a candle to represent joy. And we prayed that we will, despite everything, truly feel the joy of Christmas this year. And most recently, on the fourth Sunday, we lit a candle to represent love. The love of a God who loved us so much that we were given his only son to live among us so that we may have eternal life. For now, our fifth candle remains unlit. Our reading tonight is from Luke chapter 2. In those days a decree went out from the Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, a time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in bands of cloth, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord stood around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those he favours. Amen. start by perhaps stating the obvious it's December and it's cold outside. It is the very darkest time of the year. 
just a few days after the winter solstice. Those warm and light evenings of the summer now seem a long time ago. Those June days when it barely seems to get dark. Now it's the opposite. We know, of course, that the days will now slowly grow longer until we reach the summer again, but that seems a long way in the future. Christmas is so associated for us with the winter time, with cold weather and the darkness, and while, of course, I know that in the Southern Hemisphere it's the other way round, I find it very hard to imagine what a hot Christmas would be like. And Christmas, of course, has a long history. It really does go back before Christianity arrived. Because there's always been a midwinter festival, dating a long, long time back. A midwinter festival around this time of year. Because why wouldn't the inhabitants of Europe have a party at the very darkest time of the year? Just as the solstice has come, and the days are indeed about to start slowly getting longer again. The church built on an existing festival rather than creating a completely new one. And since then Christmas has changed many times. There are multiple Christmases going on at once. A religious festival and a secular festival. A lot of our current traditions date from Victorian times and of course, Charles Dickens had a huge influence on the way that we celebrate. So what was it like that first Christmas, although, of course, it wasn't yet Christmas then. What was it like when Jesus was born? Now, there's a huge amount that we simply don't know because it's not recorded. And we can, for the moment, if you like, leave aside the very vexed question of whether the nativity stories in the Gospels are, are best read as history or, or really as mythology. Now in Luke's version, which we've heard from, there are all sorts of historical facts which might not add up. Historians might tell us that Quirinius was not governor of Syria at the same time that Herod was king. The dates have got mixed up somewhere, at the very least. And unfortunately, there's no record of a Roman census at the right time. But if we read these stories, not as history, but as tales which are rich in symbols and meaning, stories carefully written to convey just how amazing it was that the Messiah should have been born. If we read them in those terms, they reveal all sorts of things to us. But even taking Luke's story on its own terms, that biblical account isn't quite as many people think it is. So Luke describes the family going to Bethlehem for this census and they get there and there's no space, no room at the inn. But it's not really an inn. It's not what the word means. It's something closer to a guest room. A space in the house that's away from the main living area. And there probably isn't a stable. This is not a European house. This is not a place where animals are kept away from the living space. This is a Palestinian house in the first century. The animals lived inside the house with the family. Now there may be mangers, the mangers are there, uh, recessed into the floor. Space for animal food and that would be the place you might put a baby if there was nowhere else. They're inside a house. It's probably busy. Joseph is not, according to Luke, going to a place where he is a stranger. Where he's not going to find any hospitality. Rather... He's going back to his ancestral home and he is a descendant of King David. People in this town are his relatives, whether he knows them or not. And therefore in that culture they are honour bound to offer him hospitality. And that's a serious, serious business. So 
So rather than thinking that Jesus is born in isolation, in a cattle shed away from everyone else, maybe Luke's actually describing him being born in a busy house that's filled with people, where there's no privacy, where people and animals all live together, cramped into this probably quite small space. Imagine Jesus not born in peace and quiet and isolation, but in a house packed with people. Maybe people trying to get some sleep. We don't know. Imagine a house that's packed, cramped. Jesus is there right among his people from the very beginning. He's not isolated. He's not separated. He's there with them. Now he's not born as an earthly king, he's not born with riches or into power, he's not born into a palace or a castle. He's born in a very ordinary place, apparently an ordinary house. But he is described therefore as being born among people, among extended family if you like. Maybe even people who share an some ancestry back to King David. Probably too many people getting in the way, interfering. And then, of course, the shepherds turn up. And Luke does tell us that the first people that God inspires to go and visit Jesus are these shepherds. Outsiders. People not inside the town. People who have to subsist doing a difficult, dangerous job that perhaps nobody else wants to do. But again, that's the job King David did before he was King David. Jesus is born, not in isolation, but among his people. I want to read you the words from a poem, which is also a hymn. You can find it uh, in Rejoice and Sing. And this is written by the 18th century poet Christopher Smart. Now, Christopher Smart's an absolutely fascinating figure. Um, his best known poem is possibly an ode to his cat, Geoffrey. That's really what the poem is about. It says, For I will consider my cat Geoffrey, for he is the servant of the living God, duly and daily serving him. For at the first glance of the glory of God in the east, he worships in his way. For this is done by wreathing his small body seven times round with elegant quickness. So he wreathes his body round seven times with elegant quickness when he sees the sun rising in the east to worship the Lord, the cat, that is. That's maybe how a cat might worship God. How do we do it? How are we worshipping tonight? Because we need to always remember that the gift of Jesus is, as the slogan goes, not just for Christmas. It's something to be celebrated every day. We will celebrate tomorrow when the sun comes up because it's Christmas Day. But we also need to sometimes remember to celebrate the fact the sun has come up each and every day. That everything around us is the miracle of God's creation. So here is Christopher Smart's Christmas poem. Where is this stupendous stranger? Gentle shepherd, now advise. Lead me to my master's manger. Show me where my saviour lies. O oh, most mighty, O oh, most holy, far beyond the seraph's thought. Art thou then so weak and lowly, as unheeded prophets taught? O oh, the magnitude of meekness, Worth from worth, immortal spring. Oh, the strength of infinite weakness, if eternal is so young. God, all bounteous, all creative, whom no ills from good dissuade, is incarnate and a native of the very world he made. 
God is incarnate and a native of the very world he made. Jesus is God entering into God's own creation. He's both going away and yet, in some sense, returning home. He's come to be with the world and with the people he loves. And that incarnation is vital in itself, not just for what Jesus went on to do, not just because it will, in time, lead to the cross and there's a, the resurrection. It's important because that gift of Jesus in of itself matters. That the gap between heaven and earth is shrunk. That through Jesus, who was born as a human, as a baby, who lived and suffered with and alongside the human race, who experienced all the emotions and difficulties and problems that we experience. Through that example of Jesus, we can become closer to God. And because of the birth of Jesus, we need never doubt that God loves us. Amen. It came upon the midnight clear, that glorious song of old, from angels bending near the earth to touch the harps of gold. Through all the earth, goodwill and peace from hands all gracious King. The world in solemn stillness lay. To hear the angels sing With sorrow brought by sin and strife The world has suffered long And since the angels sang Have passed two thousand years of wrong The nations still at war Hear not the love song which they bring. Oh, hush the noise, cease the strife to hear the angels So whether or not the hour has crept over midnight for you, it's Christmas for us.
It's time to light our fifth and final candle. And of course, this candle represents the birth and incarnation of Jesus Christ. It is Christmas Day, a holy day, a day of joy and celebration, a day to remember that long ago and far away, a baby was born who would change the world. Lord, we have been waiting through these long days of Advent. After a long and difficult year of disruption and uncertainty and suffering. We have tried to feel hope in a time of worry and struggle. We have tried to feel joy even as we are troubled. And we have clung, as always, to the comfort of your love. Now the waiting is over. We light a candle to celebrate the birth of Christ, the Messiah, our Saviour, in whom your promises have been fulfilled. In the quiet and lonely darkness, where flocks are sheeping and shepherds wait, the same darkness into which the light of heaven shines. May the voice of heaven speak to us today through the darkness of our world. May we hear the angels singing tidings of great joy. We remember and pray for everyone for whom this Christmas will be a struggle. We think of those separated from loved ones, those who will be on their own, those who are living with grief and serious illness. Lord, be with them to bring your love and comfort. And be with us this Christmas, as we remember that we live all of our lives surrounded by your love. Amen. So a very, very ha happy or, or merry Christmas to all of you. I know that I will be seeing some of you at our service tomorrow, and some of you will also be watching online. But I hope that you all have a wonderful day, whatever you will be doing. I hope that you enjoy both Christmas Day tomorrow and indeed the following 11 days of Christmas. Whatever you will be up to, however different and strange it may be. Slain for our pardon, his 
His promise is peace for those who believe. He's the Lamb who was given, slain for our pardon. His promise is peace for those who believe. So come, though you have nothing, come. He is the offering, come. See what your God has. Christ is born, Christ is born, Christ is born for you. Christ is born, Christ is born, Christ is born for you. So, as always, we end our worship by asking for God's blessing. Christmas Day is upon us. And whatever celebrations we may have planned, we pray that this Christmas time and beyond, the grace and love and truth of Jesus Christ, the eternal word, the light of the world, the creator of all things, will be with us and those whom we love and all of those we have prayed for tonight. Now go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Mm -hmm.